Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap and thank you for joining us today. I'm Sam Rohr and I'll be joined as normal by Pastor Isaac Crockett. Patriotic Americans, specifically Christian patriotic Americans, find themselves wondering how to think or act regarding the rise of anti-Christian and anti-Israel religions in America. Do you feel culturally pressured as a Christian American to treat as equal all worldviews, religions, political systems, even such systems as Islam, globalism, atheistic communism, and socialism? Have you even heard some Christian quote-unquote leaders say that seeking peace and unity with religious leaders from anti-Bible religious and totalitarian political systems like Islam and finding common ground is more Christian than identifying the dangerous differences in scriptural contradictions and opposing them. If you sense this cultural peer pressure to set aside biblical distinctives about life and death, truth and error, Christ and anti-Christ worldviews, bondage and freedom, well, you're not alone. In reality, Jesus warned His disciples and us about this type of deceptive pressure in Matthew 24, 4, where He said, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come even in My name, and shall deceive many. And that's truly evident in our nation and within the church in America. And for most Christians, they unnecessarily uh, wander aimlessly and ineffectively between two major biblical commands. The first is in 1 John 4, 1 to 4, where it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. Well, the second is Jesus' words to the disciples and to us in Matthew 5, 44, which guides our personal attitudes towards those who oppose the truth, where it says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good unto them that hate you, and pray for them who despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, it's the balancing of these two commands that we will seek to address on these next two programs. In today's program and next, we'll focus on the major issue of Islam in America and how Christians should biblically respond. The title of today's program in part one will be Biblically Responding to Islam as a Religion and Political System. Next week in part two, our focus will be Biblically Responding to Islam as a neighbor and co-worker. It's our goal as the American Pastors Network and our various Stand in the Gap radio and TV ministries to bring biblical and constitutional clarity to the most significant cultural issues of our day, that while they may seem to have no answer, we know that the Word of God does in fact provide all the answers to all issues in all civilizations throughout all time. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to invite in a special guest and authority on the Islamic worldview. His name is Dr. Mark Christian. He's the founder and president of Global Faith Institute. Dr. Christian is a former Muslim from Cairo, Egypt, who served as an imam or Islamic spiritual leader from the age of 12. He left Islam at age 25 after his research into Muhammad and the Quran, and they convinced him in his search that his Islamic faith was a lie and after a 10-year spiritual journey, discovered that Jesus Christ was the answer he was seeking. Dr. Christian personally understands Islam and experientially its goal for global domination, having grown up in a family intimately involved even in the Muslim Brotherhood. Isaac, let me go to you. Before we bring in Dr. Christian uh, and have him comment on how we should biblically respond and take this uh, passage about uh, trying the spirits into account. Uh, Our culture, and particularly in the younger age, you're a millennial pastor, you're dealing with a lot of younger people. Does it seem to you that we've moved as a culture to the point where almost we are afraid or almost made to feel bad about taking any kind of Christian position and 
judging or evaluating, which would obviously make it tough to do what this verse tells us to do. How did we get here, and what do you think about that? Yeah, it, it does seem like uh, many people say, oh, you don't judge me, and, and you get a lot of pushback for that. I think uh, the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4 and 5 does a great job of balancing both of them. This is the same passage where he says that uh, love is of God and that God is love. He says that just a few verses after saying, try the spirits, test, judge, be discerning of what people are saying and to uh, find Jesus Christ in it all. So we have to go back to the Word of God. Unfortunately, our culture has gotten away from that, and they've, they're scared to take a stand for what is truth. And I think you identified right there, Isaac, it is th the Bible is the standard. If we go according to this, it will balance all aspects. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what we're going to do next. So in just a moment, we're going to return, and Dr. Mark Christian will join us as we begin this look at uh, how to biblically uh, evaluate Islam in America, particularly as we look at as Islam as a religion and a political system. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator, or frontline combatant. Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping, this is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Welcome back to Stand in the Gap. And right now I want to welcome in immediately Dr. Mark Christian, uh, President and Founder of Global Faith Institute. Uh, Mark, thank you for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to be on your show. Well, it's an honor to have you on, and uh, as someone that uh, it was, it was um, as I said earlier, growing up in a Muslim family in Egypt, being an imam, having studied the, the Quran and all that you have, you're in a great position here. Uh, first, uh, first John's admonition that I quoted earlier uh, it admonishes us to try the spirits, the ideologies, whatever that may be in their specific attitude towards Jesus Christ as the prime evaluator of whether or not that ideology is of God or is not of God. What about, how to take and, take and apply that to Islam right now? How does Islam fit and compare as it relates to their view of Jesus Christ as God, Jesus Christ, as the Son of God, which is what First John 4 tells us to do. Um, as you know, and I hope everybody knows this, that Islam is based on, uh, on the theology that Jesus never died on the cross, and he was ascended up to heaven without being crucified or resurrected or any of that stuff, and that he will come at the end of times uh, again, not to... Um, praise those who followed him, but actually to praise Muhammad, the founder of Islam, and to follow Muhammad, and to become a Muslim himself, and to fight for the cause of Islam. So the idea that we look at uh, Islam and Christianity as of any kind of equal theology or equal beliefs, this is false at its, its base. And the biggest problem that we face today as Christians is we kind of focused on the, the message of love without understanding the nature of that love and that call of that love that Jesus told us to love your, our enemies. If you look at that statement by itself, love your enemy, it doesn't say compromise. It doesn't say that your enemies are not going to be lo no, uh, no longer your enemies. It says they're going to continue being your enemies, but you need to love them. And that's a huge big difference from the compromise that I see nowadays from many Christians who wants to water down their faith, water down their, their theology, water down their message, just to compromise and to be acceptable to the Muslim theology. And that is, that is based on a whole bunch of 
wrongdoings and misunderstanding of biblical values. Mark, uh, what you're saying there makes so much sense, and, and even though you have a medical doctor's degree, I don't think it takes a doctor's degree to understand what you just said. It, it, he says, love your enemy, so therefore, something is going to be there that separates us from our enemies. And in the case of Islam, looking at 1 John chapter 4, he's saying that we are to believe that Jesus has come in the flesh, he's of God, he's the Son of God, he's the only begotten of God, John says, uh, the Apostle John says in John chapter 3. So we look at Islam, they say, oh, he's a, he's a prophet, but he's going to convert, you know, he's also Muslim, he's going to, you know, be worshiping Muhammad. Um, so I, not, not only, if you, if you don't mind interrupting for a sure. second, not, not only that they actually uh, say that he's just a prophet, the, the very fact that we say that he's a son of God, that he is the, the, the source of our forgiveness, is, the, is a, an extreme blasphemy, according to Islam. So it's not only downsizing Jesus to just a prophet, but denying everything about Christianity as the utmost and the highest form of apostasy that will land you in hell forever. So when we take that, th these are polar opposites is what you're saying. Uh, you could say that what they believe about Christ is the antithesis or anti-Christ, if you want to say it that way, of what the Bible teaches about Christ. Their political system also very different uh, than, than ours. So when we look at, at the, the differences, you, you just said they're so far apart. Um, from this perspective and the teachings of Muhammad, the teachings of the Quran you know, that, that Muhammad taught, can Muslims ever, with their theology and their political stance, live at peace with Christians or Christian nations and their stance of morality and, and believing in Jesus? Yes, under one condition. When Christians are willing to subjugate themselves and to demean themselves to be a lower standard. Mm. This happened in, in Egypt where I, uh, you know, where I was born. When Islam came into Egypt, if Christians are, are, are willing to live in sub subjugation and the dhimmi's kind of a status and to pay jizya, which is a poll tax, so they can practice their own faith, they can live in peace. But otherwise, there's no peace. Islam has to be supreme, superior, in politically and religiously over, over Christians. So what Christians are doing in the United States today is willing, willingly, by their own power, by their own churches and leaders, subjugating themselves to Islam. Because when the pastor or a priest comes in and says, we all believe in the same God, and I'm going to water down Jesus, I'm not going to talk about Jesus, I'm not going to eat pork, I'm not going to eat bacon, I'm not going to do all of that stuff so I can appease to Muslims. This is basically, you are trying to buy your life from, from Islam. Islam will be super happy because this way, Islam is superior, supreme, they are not compromising anything, and you are. So, so, Mark, what you're saying is that uh, peace, in that case, is really a cessation of hostilities. It's not a resolution of the differences because under Islam, there is no peace unless they are, unless Christians are in subjugation to them to some degree. But you mentioned this as well, and I want to pursue this with you. There are many quote-unquote, Christian leaders, and I'm putting it in that perspective, who, even though they may look at 1 John 4 that we're talking about and say, well, yes, well, since Islam does not believe that Jesus is God, a matter of fact, it's a blasphemous statement to say that Jesus is God, which is what you just said, according to Islam, and that Jesus did not ever die on the cross, Therefore, he did not die for a man's sins. Therefore, there is no good news, as we would understand the Bible, because if Jesus didn't die for our sins, there is no good news. Um, even though that may be true, and according to 1 John, Islam would be as an anti-Christ spirit, they are still wanting to stand together with imams and leaders of, 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 uh, of Islam and say that we really are together and we can find common ground somehow. Uh, one of the arguments that are often said, Mark, we've talked about it with you on this program uh, before and on a radio program, uh, is the fact that uh, some are saying that, well, can't we find common ground with Islam as, as uh, Christian leaders? Because after all, we worship, they worship one God, we worship one God, can't we say that we all worship the same God of Abraham and, uh, and therefore be doing a good thing? So I want to ask you, 
that happens. Is that a good thing? Is that possible? And if not, why is that not possible to actually do that and agree? As Christians, we are followers of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? The famous statement. Did Jesus compromise when he was dealing with the Jewish leaders? Did Jesus compromise when he was talking about fasting or even, you know, healing during the Sabbath or doing any of the things that he has done during his ministry on life for the last three years of his life before the crucifixion and the resurrection? He never compromised. So he did not want to just appease to other religious leaders and says, you know, you Jewish leaders and you in the temple, you know, I'm going to build another church in the corner. Let's get along with each other. You know, um, I have a different kind of view as a, as a Jewish leader or uh, I'm going to start a new religion. And you, let's, let's, let's work with each other. You know, you do your own thing. I'll do mine. Jesus never did that. So why Christians leaders today are abandoning Jesus and his example and following him and trying to uh, create a new model of Christianity that is based on com compromise and trying to say, hey, let us find what is common between us and let us compromise what is not and let Muslims not compromise anything. Ask yourself as a Christian leader, if you're listening to this today, when you are dealing with a, with, a, with a Muslim leader, what are you asking him to compromise? What is he giving out, out of his religion when he's sitting with you on the table? He's giving absolutely nothing. You are giving everything. You say, we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are coming from Abrahamic kind of uh, narrative. We are all worship the same God. I'm not going to talk about Jesus. If Jesus you know, offends you that much, I'm not going to talk about Jesus. If eating bacon uh, offends you or drinking a little bit of beer is, offends you or having you know, any kind of uh, form of uh, freedom in Christ is, is offending you, I'm not going to do it. Let me do whatever makes you happy, and I will sit with you on the table so we can have a common ground. Would Jesus do that? No, he would not, Mark. No, he would not. And he, he, he did not. The fact is, the Bible is telling us, it's not like we have left for our, our own device to think if Jesus did or not. Jesus did not compromise. And actually, Jesus was willing to go to the cross for our own sin. With, and, and will never compromise anything from his message. He talked about he is the resurrection, he is the way. He did never, he never, you know, when, 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 when Jewish leaders approach him and, and try to see how they can get him in his own fold, he never, he never caved in, he never did any of that stuff. You know, we all talk about his actions in the temple flipping tables, but it's not only flipping tables. Look at everything he did, even when he is healing, when he is resurrecting people from death, and all of the stuff that he did, he was going, you you know, he deliberately did it on the Sabbath. He deliberately went against the Jewish teachings so he can show that he's not coming to compromise. He's coming to fulfill the law, but also to provide us forgiveness and way to heaven and to be in kingdom of, of, uh, of heaven and not of kingdom of earth whatsoever, which is Islam is teaching and preaching every day that their kingdom is on earth, that the day of judgment will never come until the flag of Islam rise on every corner on the planet earth, that the, the day of judgment will never come until Jesus himself will come and raise the flag of Islam and follow Muhammad and pray behind him. Dr. Christian, you, you've brought, I think, a very powerful answer to that question. That was great. Really quick question before we go on uh, to the next thing after this break. Um, you said that they, they want to bring this into a worldwide, you know, worldwide victory, so to speak. That's more of a government issue. So when we look at the government, we see that religiously there can't be compromise with them. They want all or nothing, and, and they want it all. Um, so with governments that are controlled, you know, these totalitarian regimes controlled by Sharia law, morality, their basis, versus a free government like Americans that are based on biblical morality, real quick question here, can those governments ever come to compromise or to agree together? Well, uh, Christian governments, West governments, uh, America government is willing to compromise. Muslims are willing to compromise. They do sometimes according to Sharia law still, within the Sharia law, within Islamic law, you know, instead of using big terms like Sharia law and so forth, within Islamic law, within the Quranic law, there is a law of necessity. So Muslims find out that if they are willing to appease a little bit, lie a little bit, put some lipstick on a pig for a little bit, so they can reach their own goal of making Islam supreme and superior, and to make themselves, uh, you know, winners in, in the equation, Islam allows that, and this is only the, 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 the field of compromise that they are willing to use. Only when it is necessity, only when it is necessary. And what, what breaks my heart the most is 
you know, I have access, and I'm I'm a, I, I memorize the Quran as a as a young young kid, and Arabic is my main language. You know, I have accent today, so this is why because I I know very well Arabic, and when I listen and watch all the media outlets, whether social media, whether, you know, uh, TV or any media outlet, which is enormous amount right now, way better than when I came to the United States, you can see the difference between the two. You see, even even in my Twitter feed, I look at Muslim tweets and look at Christian tweets side by side, and this is one saying one thing and the other one is saying, you know, I wish every Christian leader would just click translate on the tweets and they read what they what Muslims are saying what Muslim leaders are saying on a daily basis whether it comes to Israel or the United States or Christianity or anything like this it, it is there is a schizophrenia and deception in the world that we live in right now well mark you you've pointed out this uh, over repeatedly here and on other programs for us but there is so much deception we live in a world where satan is trying to deceive and uh, it seems like we, we need to help to defend against that. We're going to take a, a short break. We're going to come back to wrap things up and talk about this deception, talk about how Christians uh, can respond biblically to Islam, both as the religious part of it and the political system that it represents. We're going to take this time out and be right back. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia, positively different television. Mark, I want to go back to you right now and ask you to summarize. If we could take uh, this issue we're talking about, biblical response. How should the American Christian, a Christian, respond and think about, act in response to Islam? And we're looking at these two points, as a religion, as a political system, because both of those are confronting the American Christian today. We're being asked to entertain uh, Islam in America as just uh, another equi equivalent uh, form of government, just a little bit different than ours, but not. And, and religious leaders are saying, let's stand and put our arms around the Islamic faith and the leaders because we all worship the same God at the end of the day. But First John tells us that when we go to the heart of Jesus Christ, Islam says Jesus Christ is not God and he's just a prophet and all the things you talked about. So therefore we have now a position. So if you were to tell our viewers and our listeners right now, how should the American Christian view Islam biblically as a religion and as a political system, what would you say? Love your enemy, but understand your enemy. Try to save your enemy. Try to understand where the enemy is coming from. It's very important actually to understand the theology and the political system of Islam. Islamic uh, political system only allows for theocracy, socialism, and dictatorship. It is not a chance, it's not by chance that the authoritative dictatorship of the Muslim world is vibrant and it is the only uh, uh, monarchy that exists today in the world is coming from Saudi Arabia, from the Arab Emirates, from Oman, and even those who have a uh, pseudo-democratic system, they have dictators, because this is the only system that Islam allows. So love your enemy, reach out your enemy, understand your enemy at the same time, because the biggest commandment of Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations. He did not say go, uh, you know, compromise to all nations. He said, love your enemy. And the best form of love is to try to save your enemy from the atrocities and from the, the, the horrific system and from the despair that Muslims are living uh, under every day. And Mark, but never and, compromise your own faith. And Mark, thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap this up, this program right now. Next program next week, we are going to take the same theme, biblically responding to Islam, and we're going to talk more specifically about how do you show love? 
How do we deal with the neighbor next door who is a Muslim or our co-worker in light of the fact that the religion itself is an anti-Christ religion and political system? Well, thank you for watching for <clears throat> the program today. I hope that you go to our website, standinagapmedia.org. Let us know that you're watching. Communicate with us. Pray with us. Partner with us at Stand in the Gap so that we can continue to bring these programs to you. And thank you so much for watching the program. Stand in the gap for truth where you are.